Welcome to Big Blue Breakdown with your host, Matthew Lyle. I'm joined today not with Buck Nasty, not with Christopher King of the Hill, but with a special guest of mine. Been so excited, been talking to him for a while. My man, Darren Rogers, D-Rod. Tell us about yourself. How you doing today, Darren? Hey, Matt. Thanks for, or Matt, thanks for having me. I'm very excited. I've been listening to the podcast for quite some time now. Uh, it's an honor to be on. Uh, yeah, I'm just like everybody else, big Kentucky fan. Um, I write four Kentucky articles for sportsmediapass.com. And uh, that's that's about it. <laughs> hey, hey, I will take it. Now, first off, I apologize to anybody listening to the show. I, I don't know exactly what I sound like, but I imagine I sound like what he sounds like. So if you ever have trouble differentiating between us, that's fine. It's going to be a great show. So I actually really enjoy your articles that you write. And you told me a little something behind the scenes. You gave me a little peek behind the magic curtain of the company that you write for that you just you can't just do a recap. You have to put a good spin on it. You have to put something, you know, like I don't really know how to, how to say it. Maybe you can describe it a little better. But it makes the story a little bit more flavorful. It adds a little seasoning opposed to just saying, hey, like your last article, hey, we could lose to Vandy or, hey, this is what Vandy's going to be. You wrote a whole article about how that could be a trap game which I found is, is a much more interesting read. Tell us a little bit about the, the stuff you write, the process you go through, you know, the, the stuff you can give to us normal folk. Yeah, that's right. Um, our website at sportsmediapass.com, we, we try to be different than every other website. And everybody, CBS Sports, ESPN, they all do recaps of games. So we just kind of made a rule at the start when they started this website, no recaps, just opinions, just thoughts. And takes on the game. So, ever since then, I've, I haven't wrote a recap in my entire writing career. It's just opinionated posts and articles. Usually takeaways and what this team could be compared to other teams and how we're doing compared to the top 25. Stuff like that. It's, it really makes you think as, as a writer and a reader, even. It, it does. And, and as someone who... I don't write. I, I can't write to save my life. But as someone who, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I love doing these shows and I, I prep these shows. And I will start it. I will start in one area when I'm when I'm preparing and I'm talking to myself. But by the time I'm done, I will have talked myself into a completely different corner. Since you're not doing just blanket recaps where you're like, "Hey, A B A team, B T B team," do you ever find yourself writing an article about one subject? But then halfway through, because you're trying to be creative, you're trying to put out your best content, you're, you end up writing a, an entirely different article because the article you did have just didn't have the legs, and then you find yourself wanting to just go an opposite direction. Oh, yeah, that happens to me all the time. And I, I actually am, am very lucky. I have a great editor that works closely with me, and he is actually the editor for the Lexington Herald in Bill Kane. Oh, wow. So, Mr. Kane, and he helps me a lot. He'll... He'll just give me a call every once in a while and say, uh, I think you need to look at your third paragraph. It makes no sense at all. Get back on topic. And that happens to me every once in a while. But I'm lucky to have him. You know, this is something, it's weird. This is something I actually kind of nerd out about is I, I enjoy, like, music, for example. When, when a band comes up and they say, hey, you know, we wrote this world's most popular song, but come to find out it was supposed to be a Pepsi ad. You know, right. I, I just find that so so hilarious. And and to me, that is just one of the most entertaining things. You're a very creative person, great writer. So it, I found a lot of interest in, you know, is he, what what was his groundwork for this article? You know, what was, because, you know, Vanderbilt, that, that piece was very well written, didn't end up being a trap game, but very easily could I seen what inspired that article. When I read it, like, I wasn't worried. I read it. I was worried. Yeah. So... Uh, it's, it was very, uh, very well written piece. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you too: you got to be a part of was it the Music City Bowl? You were yes. you were signed to write it. Another a great time, I imagine. What was your thoughts when they put you into the the media booth? Because it's not it, it's not like the NBA, I imagine, where you're right up on the sidelines. You're right, up right. quite high, right? Yeah, we were actually in the first level press box there at Nissan Stadium. Um, it, it was definitely an experience. I I had no 
you know, mutual interest in either team. It was Auburn and Purdue, and I was in between two Purdue riders. I actually learned a lot about the Boilermakers and met two awesome Purdue riders that were really just next level above me even, I mean. And it was almost – it had, it had me starstruck a little bit when I first did it because – I'm used to just writing articles, you know, on my own. And then here I am going to a press box at Nissan Stadium. And, right. Man, it, it's it's different. That's for sure. I mean, we, I knew it was different when uh, – I, pr- I probably shouldn't say this, but uh, at halftime uh, they gave out free food and the offensive coordinator for Auburn was in there eating eating lunch, just sitting there, sitting there at the table two rows down from me. I'm like, don't you need to be talking to the team or something right now? <laughs> See – that's what I love. Now, obviously, I don't want you to say anything that's going to get you in trouble. And, and you told me some things, you know, off the record that I, I don't feel comfortable saying. If you want to bring up the, the rules of the press box, the press box one-on-one, that's fine. But it's things like that that I enjoy, the, the little nuances of an experience. So let me ask you this. Given what you did for the Purdue-Auburn game, you care less. You're writing the story. You're, just, you're writing what you see. Right. You got a clear mind, clear heart. You could care less. It just happened to be – a very lopsided game, so I'm sure it got boring at times. But everything was decided for you early on. Yeah, yeah. Could you have done the same thing for Kentucky? Like, if it was Kentucky, Florida next year at Kroger Field, do you feel like you would be level to sit back and enjoy it the same way you did this team, this game you didn't care about? I actually have had this conversation with some of my buddies, and I don't think I could – be in the press box for a Kentucky game because one of the main rules of the press box is you can't cheer because there's fans of there's riders for both teams in there and you can't take videos or anything like that you can take pictures but you cannot take videos that that's frowned upon right therefore it would be hard to watch our Wildcats play without being able to cheer for them and I have season tickets to Kroger Field I'd rather just go as a fan and then write about it later because I like, I like being around, you know, all the fans in the crowd. Absolutely. And, and I want to shelf that discussion just real quickly. Because that, that baff, I get the thing with the no video. I, I get that to a degree. But – and probably because they don't want video of an Auburn offensive coordinator in there eating the buffet. That's probably you – know, Right, probably right. Want, not one that. But the thing that – okay, so first off, typically aside from the, the rare bowl game that you were at, Typically, your media press box is going to have Team A fan or Team A writer and a Team B writer. And I imagine you can't cover a team for 10, 5, 10, 20 years and not be a fan. Right. I, I, so, as big and as lavish as these stadiums are, I mean, because they, they, they've made a killing these last, I think this last season, maybe two seasons, of uh, who, is it, is it, who's the Mike guy that's in the booth? who's like a very passionate Kentucky announcer. Oh, they're going to kill me for forgetting this name. But they Michael he's Bennett. so passionate. No, no. He's not a writer. He, he's the guy who does like the radio yeah, announcement. Yeah, Michael Bennett, isn't it, with just the tip or the morning tip-off show? No, the, this about? guy's the one that broadcasts the game. Like when the game's on, oh, he's Mike like, Leach. Benny Smith. Mike Leach, yes. I, I thought it was Mike Leach, but I was thinking about the Washington State coach too. So, right. uh, so yeah, Mike Leach. They, they, he gets very passionate. And obviously, he's in his own little box. Right, right. Why can't they just do that? You know, if it's Kentucky, Florida, why can't Florida writers have their box? Why can't Kentucky writers have their box? And just let – I mean, obviously, you don't want to be cheering in there like you're at the local B-dubs. But fist pump when your team when, – when Benny – well, it won't be Benny Snell. But when Benny Snell took it for a 50-yard touchdown, fist pump, you know. Right, right. I, I hate the fact that you just got to sit there and be like, oh, that was a cool run. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, hey, it sounded like a great experience. What you said about being a season ticket holder. I was a ticket. I was a. I was a ticket snub, snob, for the longest. If I couldn't sit right behind the coach, I didn't want to go. I'd rather watch it on my big screen. Well, last year my mom got tickets. Worst tickets I'd ever been to. Worst when she got the tickets. I, I, I had a smile on my face, but in my mind I was very disappointed. Right. It was way up in the top. I was up by the flags. My back was against that concrete wall. I got there three hours early. It was cold. It was rainy. It was damp. I was depressed. As a Kentucky fan, I couldn't get excited for this game because of where I was sitting. I I was like, I'm not going to see nothing. Three hours later, it's Kentucky, Mississippi State. That place is rocking. Not a seat in the house. Greatest view ever. Probably the best game I've ever watched. Yeah. So, 
I I have season tickets, but my tickets they're not in the lower level. They're actually in two oh six, which is up near the flags. I'm I'm a little bit lower than the flags, but I I think it's a it's a great environment, even in the upper deck at, at the Commonwealth. So at Kroger Field, <laughs> yeah, not, Kroger. not the Commonwealth. You, you you call it anything you want here. I'm not going <laughs> to judge because I get it. Because Kroger Field, and the, uh, yeah, don't even get me started on that one. But yeah, it, that's what it was. Now I don't I don't want to be shoved up at the top at Rupp. But for that game, that was a great view. Yeah. All the good plays looked better. I could see when Benny Snell was going to break a run. I seen the interception he was going to throw. You saw the sacks developing because of the angle you had. Yeah. You also saw some run, some, some read options that Terry Wilson missed. But it was a great experience. So that really taught me that if I can get these $70, $80, $100 tickets and my back be against that wall, but it's a big-time game, I will never pass that up again. So – Great experience. Great having you on. Let's start. Let's start talking about what the real reason we're here. All right. Yesterday, pulled it out. Woo, I, I still can't believe. And I don't know why, but I, I guess just the feel. We got the win versus Florida. Yeah, it is always tough to play in Gainesville. It seems like they always make crazy shots against us. And for about 30, what, five minutes of that game, I think all of Big Blue Nation was kind of biting their nails thinking, oh, my goodness. It's yes. Good. So, so give me your give give me your takeaway. Give me what give me what Darren thought from tip off to final minute, to final coach's handshake. Take take me through your thoughts on that. Well, well, starting in the first half, we just couldn't make a shot, and and sometimes that happens. You know, you're going to throw up clunkers, especially when you've won six straight games and and you just scored forty five points in the first half against somebody on the road. You're due for a clunker, and we. We just couldn't make shots other than Tyler, and when he got in foul trouble, nobody could make shots. And then in the second half, when Florida went into that one, I believe it was a one-two-two kind of trap zone, it pushed our offense out, and for a good, what, five to seven minutes, we couldn't figure it out. We were lost on offense. Right. Cal Perry had to pull Hagens, put quickly in, and quickly couldn't do much either. But the the most amazing thing is great teams find a way to win those games. And I, I was PJ's biggest critic um, last year and even at the beginning of this year. And I, I just never thought he was going to get over that hump of being kind of like the Alex Poitras type where he would, he would have, a, have a good half and then just kind of disappear. But he rallied the troops yesterday. And I don't know if you've seen where, they, uh, where he kind of pulled everybody together and he kind of just gave, for lack of a better word, word he spoke his mind to the team and it seemed right from then on out the defensive intensity stepped up and when this team's playing good defense their offense turns turns the corner yeah that i mean kelton johnson had his first three shots blocked if you want to call them shots it looked like he attempted to do a dunk slash layup (laughs) so either way he he got nothing of it right Um, one thing that i found interesting and i'm not suggesting any any shenanigans of the sort but you know sometimes high, i said this last night on, on my post game show sometimes high schools will let the grass grow a little taller if you're t- if, if team a is faster than team b you know before the days of turf everywhere it was not illegal you just let the grass grow just a little longer right and, and it slowed the guy down right i wonder i have very seldom have i seen places where a missed shot a missed free throw Sounds like that rim was going to break off. Yeah, I wonder if within the le- within the scope of the rules, if Florida's rim's just a little looser than maybe Rupp or maybe a, a tournament site because you know tournaments aren't held in Gainesville. So I, I within like I said within the scope of the rules, I just wonder if you almost like the old park days. You know, you go to the park and it's got that crooked rim, right? And and you know if you shoot from one side, it's going to go in a little better than if you shoot from the other side. Right. I just wonder if that's how it was because I've never – hey, look, I'm not blaming that on Kentucky's missed free th- three-pointers. We, we do that on our own enough. But just to see and hear some of these clanks that when they're thrown up, I just wonder if that's, what, if that's what you do when you're in these smaller stadiums. You get these weird baskets. You get the baskets that hang from the roof opposed to the ones that have the base on the ground. You get just weird little tactics that mess up your – you know, your, your perception, mess, mess up the depth, mess up the shot sound. I mean, because if you're Florida, you're practicing that. Right. But right. if you're Kentucky, 
you know, you're used to a nice solid rim. You're not, you're Rupp Arena and Yum Center, in my opinion, is about as good as an NBA stadium as you're going to get in college. Right. But, you know, you go to places like Florida, uh, Georgia Tech, a lot of those ACC smaller schools do it. Like they just have this weird sounding rim. And I wonder if it's an attempt to throw off these good high powered teams. Yeah, that, I, that, that, that could be true. I, I never thought of it like that. They do, they do do stuff a little differently down there in Gainesville, so I wouldn't put it past them. I'm just saying, when, when the shot hit, and when, when you miss a, a, a free throw, and it makes just this rattling noise that I have never heard a, a rim make other than the one down at the park or by, by your house, I was just, I was like, why is it making that noise? And, you know, like the old double rims, you know, you, you miss a shot on a double rim, that thing's going to bounce everywhere back in the parks. So yeah. you brought up a good point there, PJ leading this team. That's one thing I like about this team, and I want to know your thoughts a little more on this. You've seen Hagens yell at Keldon. You've seen Keldon yell at Hero. You've seen PJ yell at the entire team. You've seen Travis get on whoever he happens to get on. It feels like no one takes offense to this. They all feel like they're a good group of friends. Right. That's that's got to be something special, right? Oh, I mean, let, let me tell you, it. It. I don't. I'm sure the rest of the Big Blue Nation kind of feels a little bit like this, but when. When we're playing defense and it turns into making a shot or two and this team starts getting excited and, you know, they they all – it seems like every one of them has a variation of a flex they like to do. And then they chest bumping everywhere. That is just fun to watch. This team has turned into a team that I think is just one of the most fun teams to watch that we've had in, in quite a while, honestly. You know, one thing I think with P.J., I, I mean, Mike talked about this a couple of weeks ago. I think he came in last year thinking he was going to be a first round pick. He played. I mean, he 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 did what he he thought was enough. I'm not saying he dogged it. I'm not saying he he just didn't try. I I think he thought he did the bare minimum. Yes. And then in that Kansas State game, when the team started clicking, I think he decided he could play better, but he realized there was some actual holes in his game. Because he dominated against K State, just couldn't hit a free throw to save his life. Right. I think he then came into this year a little flustered, a little upset at himself, realizing that he may have cost himself some money. Right. And then I think somewhere along the line, I don't know who dude, I don't know who did it. Was it Reed Travis, the fifth year man from Stanford? Was it Calipari, who's been turning NBA guys out? Was it a scout? Was it just an epiphany that he had in the middle of the night? Something told him that if I do the little things. The teams will still draft me if I hustle, if I play good defense, because that's really how it started. He really wasn't giving you much, but against North Carolina and Louisville, he was playing really good defense. Right. And, and then that led to really great offense. And now he's, climbing, he's shooting up that draft chart. I don't want him to go, but I, I, I'm, I'm a realist. I know, I know that he's probably going to a junior at Kentucky, especially one that started for two seasons. It's really rare nowadays. But I think that's what happened. I think somewhere along the line, he was thinking me first, and then he started thinking team first, and it's helped him. It's helped the team. It's helped his future. And, and I, I really enjoy what I see. And that's one thing I'm so excited about. You, you sent me a message last night that made me laugh. You said you spent an hour and a half trying to spin a loss into a good thing. Right. <laughs> Maybe I'm in denial here. But – I've seen everything I need to see from this team to know we can win a championship. Yeah, I agree. I, I still want that number one seed. I still want to go through Louisville. I think why not make it as easy as possible for yourself? You right. Know? But I love the fact that we are checking off boxes. Yes. We, we came into this season playing the national champion. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. Yes. I think there's a good chance Kentucky Duke is your national championship game. Yeah. We came into the season playing that, and we got dog walk. How many times do you get to get dog walk at the beginning of the season in a national championship game? It just doesn't happen. Right. Then we lost to some – you would consider them second-round teams, Seton Hall, Bama, decent teams that have a player that gets hot. We lost to that, but we figured it out. Right. And the last two weeks, Kansas, Florida, on the road, we're, we're winning games – against Sweet 16, Elite 8-style atmospheres where either, A, we come from a big deficit, don't matter, we're going to win by 10. 
You know, we, we right. was down by 10 to Kansas, went into halftime trailing, down by 10 to Florida, trailing at halftime. Both games would win double digits. Right, and that's where I think this schedule has actually helped this team. When this schedule first came out, everybody said, oh, man, Kentucky, woo. Mm-hmm. We, we're, this is the toughest Cal Perry schedule he's had. We're playing all the best teams in the SEC, a very good SEC. Twice. Twice. You know? And it's spread out enough that it seems like every game we've played here recently has been a big game and had mm-hmm. a big game feel, and we're just – they're finding ways to win. It, and and it goes back to, like you said, about P.J. taking over this team. If you look at P.J. while he's playing the game, he is always smiling now, and he didn't do that last year. He, he, he right. It looks like he is genuinely having a fun college experience out there playing basketball. And last year, he I guess he took it like business or or something like that. And actually, if you watch the SEC now, and our boy Antoine Walker said had an awesome take on on PJ and his improvement. He said, Antoine said that he went to a practice at the start of last year, and and PJ was kind of going through wind sprints and drills like they were wind sprints and drills. He was just kind of going through the motion. Right. He said he went to another practice about a month ago, and the same drills PJ was leading the team in. Doing not just going through the motions. Now he's putting in the work, and it, it. I think it shows. I think he's having a blast out there, and I think he's the one that's actually making this team go. Oh, a- absolutely! I completely agree. And and let's compare it to what we're trying to do here. Me and you, and our each right. We're we haven't. An, obviously, I've read your articles, and I know you went to college, and and you get paid to do it. But you have a natural act, knack for writing, and and I I love to talk, and and we enjoy we enjoy what we do. But if we want to be good, if we want to be great, if we want to be, if you want to be the next KSR and, and, and I'm the next Matt Jones, there's, there's the little things we're going to have to identify and work on. Right. When you get to the NBA, everybody can shoot. Everybody can dunk. Everybody can block and rebound. But can you do those things and, like you said, treat win sprints like it's the NBA finals? Right. Can you, can you guard a guard? Can, can you guard James Hart? Now, obviously, you know, not to get an NBA talk, but can you do your deed on, on the Warriors? And, and that's why I think a lot of these kids have to realize, and that's why I don't think Cal gets enough credit. Right. Is, look, yes, Duke and Kansas do this one-and-done thing. Take away Kyrie Irving. Where's the, where's the Duke guys balling out? Jason Tatum, I guess? Yeah. But, exactly. you know, but, but Cal's giving you guys that was ranked worse. People forget because Kyle, Kyle Anthony Towns came in and dominated. If you look at that ESPN recruiting class, Carlton Towns was number 11. Right. There was a, somebody said there was 10 guys bigger, 10 guys better. A Mecca, not a Mecca Okafor, what was the kid? Jaleel, Jabril Okafor, the kid from Duke. Right. Where's he at? He's not even on a roster anymore. Carlton Towns going to an all-star game. Yeah. And- Justice Winslow, those kids, oh, they're better than that kid. No, they're not. Cal says, hey, I see talent in you. We're going to get it out of you. I see that happen with PJ, and I think he doesn't get near enough credit. Yeah, and Cal Perry takes these – I mean, it's been talked about to death, so I won't talk about it much. But he takes these guys that are huge recruits, and he said, yeah, we know you can score 30 a game, but for this particular team, we need you to score 10 and have eight or nine rebounds, like Anthony Davis or something. Anthony Davis could have Anthony Davis could have walked out there, if we were being honest, and scored 30 a game, and we could have played – we could have slowed down the pace and just went inside to him all the time. But he didn't have to. Cal Perry kind of molded his game around the rest of the team. And he's done that with just about every player unless he, you know, doesn't have enough players and has to have Malik Monk score 40-something to win the game. You know, you said something very interesting there before you got into a very great point. You said you don't want to beat this point to death. It's been done. But it hasn't. Yes, it has. Everybody says it. But for some reason – a large majority of the fan base, a large section of the fan base, so well, I won't give it the majority, but a large section of the fan base don't look at it like that. And I think you can't look at something as just black or white, one or two. Like, there's a lot of middle ground. Right. Yes, these kids come in highly recruited, but recruits can be wrong. I mean, look at the kid down at Murray State. He wasn't, he wasn't ranked anything. Right. Kid's right. going to be a top three pick. So there's a lot of middle ground. And if you notice, Cal doesn't go for these selfish me guys. Right. Cal didn't go after uh, Ben Simmons. Right. Cal did a little recruiting on Michael Porter, but pulled out. Right. Cal didn't really go after Mikel Fultz. Like he, he right. doesn't. He wants guys that are good, 
he wants guys that are can can play, but he wants them that fits his system. Right. I want to get back to the schedule you mentioned. I, I enjoy so much. I literally have this printed out and hanging on my wall. I have it memorized by this point. But the schedule, like you said, is lends itself to the test I think a team needs to win a title. You know, we'll talk a little bit about the South Carolina game. But you know Frank Martin always has them kids playing tough. You get a Mississippi State team on the road. That's a tournament team. Right. You get an LSU team. That team's going to be scrappy. You get the big team. That's a Final Four game right there, Tennessee. Yep. Then then you go at Missouri. Okay, that's a little bit of a break, but that's still a tough game. That is not a give me. You get an Auburn team that you embarrassed on their home court, and they think they should have beat you, even though, let's be real, we've outplayed them. Right. They're going to come into rough angry. That's at least an Elite Eight tile game. You got yes. an Arkansas team. That's, that's going to be a pesky game. At Tennessee, at Tennessee, in that environment, that's a national championship-style game. And then you wrap up with Ole Miss and Florida, two very pesky teams that you're going to see in March. So I'm excited. I, what's your thoughts? I, I'm very excited. I, I'm, I know everybody likes to see us win about 30 games a year, but I am so excited that the SEC has finally gotten good again. I was so tired of just 14-2, and 16-0. and 0. I was tired of running through teams and beating them by 40. I'm, I'm loving this, how the SEC conference is so much tougher. And, yeah, it, you're going through that list right there, and I don't have the schedule in front of me, but every single one of those games are going to be tough. Even the Missouri yep. game, that's on the road. You never Absolutely. know about on the road. And Arkansas just beat LSU last night. I mean, and, and started the game or second half six of nine from three point land. When Arkansas exactly. threes, they're tough, man. Exactly. No, I, and well, I can't drive this point home enough because anyone who's ever played sports or just watched a lot of sports, you can't throw out the human factor. And the human factor in the SEC is we are king. We have been king for a long time. We have dominated for a long time. We have broke a lot of hearts. Teams right. remember that. Right. The, the, the 65-year-old man that's going to be at that Arkansas game who's an Arkansas fan or going to be at this Ole Miss game, he remembers. He remembers the 70s when they couldn't touch us, the right. 80s when they didn't stand a chance, the 90s when it was laughable. Right. <laughs> Don't you think they're going to be motivated? Uh, I, oh, I, yeah. I, I, draw, I draw back to, I think, 2016 when we went to Auburn and lost Bruce Pearl's first year, and everybody's like, how could we lose to Auburn? Right. Weren't we like something like 98 and two versus them in like a, a certain time span? Right. You beat a team 90 times, you're going to be passionate. There's a reason it took four years for us to beat Kansas. Everybody on that roster for Kansas remembered Kentucky beating them by 40. Right. Kentucky kids didn't. Right. So I, I don't know what you what everybody expects of these kids, but you can't throw out that that that. And the fact that the SEC is now good, yes, man, it's, it's going to lead to some good games. And something I caution, you know, you, you mentioned losing to Florida. This isn't like typical years. Typical years, you get four SEC losses, you're going to be a five seed. You could, in theory, right. now obviously Tennessee is dominating, but you can, in theory, have three or four conference losses and still get a one seed. Right. This is what it's, this is what it's like to play in the ACC. This is what it's like to play in that old school Big East. This is – I enjoy it. I enjoy it. Yeah, and you can tell the environment's still there. I mean, it, Florida, who I think uh, – I'm blanking on the record, but I think they were like 12-7 and seven or 11-8 and eight last before last night. And mm-hmm. they had students out there with tents camping out. It's, this, it's their Super Bowl. Kentucky's always exactly. been every, – every team in the SEC It's the Super Bowl. Because, yeah, I know Tennessee's number one in the nation right now. But if you beat Tennessee, you beat the number one team, that's all gravy and cool. But if you beat Kentucky, you can say, we beat Kentucky and Coach right. Cal. And everybody wants to say that. So I, it, Absolutely. It, it never matters how good we are, how bad we are. We're always going to be the Super Bowl, and that's what makes just about every single game tough. And I think Tennessee's finding that out now, too, as they're playing some of the weaker teams in the SEC and having trouble with them. Like they had a little bit of trouble with A&M yesterday until they pulled away in the end. And they shouldn't have trouble with A&M, but A&M treated it like, hey, this is the number one team. We got to get up for this game. And, and that's, how, that's how it works when you're a top-tier team. You're going to get everybody's best shot. You know, I find this funny. It's funny that you say that because I think – and there's, a, there's an, either a th- an even more point to why I laugh at watching Tennessee. Tennessee 
is like any other sport when you see these teams come out with a great record. When, when you're watching the NBA or the NFL and a team that you had no idea was going to be good starts out 7-1, and one, starts out 30-5, and five, whatever you may be, you know, whatever sport you watch, baseball, maybe he starts out great. You know, you mentioned before the show you're a golf fan. You know, you get this guy who's a golfer out of nowhere. He's on the leaderboard second day in. And then That's you right. just see this crumble. And it's because they used all their energy. They used all their effort to get to the top, but they don't have any more energy to sustain it. Right. You know, people laugh. You know, the Super Bowl today, people laugh. Every week they called New England dead. They're over. No, New England just knows not to – No, sorry to break your heart here. I know who your NFL team is. New England took no pride in beating the Titans. It was right. nothing. It, it was nothing to them. Yes. Tennessee was hyped. Same happened to Jacksonville. Jacksonville treated that like it was a Super Bowl. T- Patriots could have cared less. Look right. where they're at. And exactly. I, think that, I think that's what you're going to see with Tennessee. They're uh, out here dominating so much. But when, when you remove that one brick, when – I would I wouldn't be surprised if they don't lose very early on in the SEC tournament. Well, the the thing if you look at Tennessee's schedule, and I don't want to say too many bad things about them because I do live in Tennessee, and my little brother's a sophomore at the University of Tennessee. Nah. They, are, they are diehard <laughs> Vols fans. But, and I'm sure they'll listen to this later. But at the end of the Tennessee schedule, that's when they're they play their tough conference games. They've got a string of about five games where they're playing Kentucky twice. They're playing. They end the season at Auburn, and they still have to play at LSU. They still got to play at Mississippi State. They've got Ole Miss at home. I mean, they they're about to go in a stretch where they're going to have to play some of their better basketball. And right now, with with them, you know, yeah, they've got a couple guys taking over, but their main cog last year, Schofield, it, he's he's struggling to find his shot right now. And I think they're going to drop a game or two on the road just because up until this point. Yeah, they're eight zero in the SEC right now and just rolling, but they're not really playing the top tier SEC team right. at the moment. They're playing Vanderbilt and Missouri and Texas A and M, you know. And Ar- they played Arkansas, but they played Arkansas at home, you know. Uh, you want an unpop? <laughs> they're getting ready, getting their meat in their schedule, and it'll be interesting to see how they handle it. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how they handle that. And I'll be honest with you, this this might be a very unpopular opinion. Now, and all of this depends on how Kentucky does down the stretch, too. I'm rooting for Tennessee. I actually hope – obviously, I want to beat Tennessee at Rupp. I never want to lose at Rupp. Right. But I'm, I'm rooting. I, I, would, I would have a little smirk on my face if we got blasted in Knoxville. Because right. as a Kentucky fan, I know, I know these kids. They're, they're, we, we, we spoke very highly about everybody in the squad in, the, in this show. But they, it's not done. If they never lose another game, they could go lay an egg in the Sweet 16. No, I need but one last game that's a punch in the mouth that says, hey, you haven't made it yet. And, right. I, hope, and I, I hope that's the only loss that Tennessee has. And then I right. hope they come in the SEC tournament and then just lay a dud. And then in the, in the, and I say this, and I know, like I said, no disrespect for any Tennessee fan listening, but I'm saying this because I don't want to play them in the Final Four. I, I, right. I, I would prefer the easiest route. The only part of me kind of wants to play Duke is some revenge tour. Right. But I, I – I, as a Kentucky fan, I need us to take that one punch in the mouth. And I think at Tennessee is that best place where no one's going to judge you harshly, especially if you beat them at Rupp. Yeah, so, I, I, got, I, got, oh, I, I got a good Tennessee story for you, too. I, I, always, I always give the Tennessee fans a little bit of the business every time. And they're number one right now, so they're on cloud nine. And I told them, I said, look, y'all are, y'all are having a great year. It's awesome. It's just like us in football. You know, this was our best year. In, since 77 this is your best basketball year since 77 uh-huh. you know and, and and they get upset about that and then last night i don't know if you watched the tennessee game at all i, I had to because i got family down here and they showed this graphic it was talking about tennessee football and it said they have already avenged all their losses in the sec and i, <laughs> I made i made a good comment i thought to them i said well well, you didn't lose to us in football, so that means we're going to get you in basketball, right? Hey, I, and, you, oh, they didn't like I that. put on to that. I, I enjoy little things like that. I was so sure we were going to win the title last year just because Kentucky seems to win the title on years that end in eight every 20-year variables, 78, 98, 2018. I thought it was a gift. Had my heart right. broken. So I, I hold on to things like that. Actually, speaking of Tennessee fans, I, I found humor in this. They are celebrating, because apparently, I didn't know this, but apparently Tennessee and Ohio State 
were two of the only programs to never have more than seven losses in their entire program. Well, this year, Tennessee lost eight, right? Right. Well, there's rumors or the, there's a lot of speculation that when, when everything's said and done with this Missouri stuff, that Missouri will have to vacate all their wins last year, which means, in theory, they did not beat Tennessee last year, which means, in theory, they had seven losses. Which, if you believe that, means they continue their streak of never having more than seven losses. So, (laughs) Tennessee is the only school that I know that can take a four and seven season and spin it good. So, props to you, Vols fan. Yeah, (laughs) that's exactly right. So, kind of, like I said, just kind of get back on here. I'm looking, I'm, I'm hyped. And one thing I think this is so interesting with the Cal team. Throw out the, the highest and lowest. Throw out 12 and 13 because those were very, those were like off the scale. We 12, we were great all year, and we finished great. 13, we were bad all year, and we finished bad. Right. Typically, Cal's given you one or two types of teams. He's given you 11, 14, and we'll say last year, where you've really just been dogged all season. Right. But then you get a little bit of glory in the, in the postseason, and you can't handle it. You fizzle out. Against right. teams you shouldn't. We should have never lost to any of those UConn teams or K-State last year. Right. And I, and I think it's because you're, you're being the underdog all year. When you finally get a taste of that glory, you don't know how to handle it. Right. And then there's the opposite. There's 2010, there's 2015, and 2017 maybe, but it's in its own little category, where you've been the, the big dog all year and the little dog trips you. You know, right. the West Virginia, the West Constant team. No, we none of those were the team. We we thought the only team that could beat us both those years was Duke. Right. And and we did. This year is very intriguing. We stepped off those planes from Bahamas like we just won the national championship. Right. Right. We got beat so bad by Duke, people took us out of college football, basketball. Like people people said Kentucky's a football school now. Like they, yeah. they refused to acknowledge we had a basketball program. Right. We literally got sent to the dungeon. Like Dark Knight Rises, we had to climb from the, the dungeon with a broken back. Exactly. Yep. And now here we are. And, and if you look at it in each game, we have a mini, a mini version of that. We're down. Dan Dockage, which I enjoyed Dan Dockage's performance. But I Dan Dockage, Dan Dockage was saying, oh, this is a horrible shooting team. And then to heap the praise at the end, I think these kids are going to go into March experiencing literally everything you can experience. Right. I, I, I agree. I agree, too. And what makes this team different from the past teams, I've always been worried because in the tournament, everybody knows a team can get hot from the outside and they can mm-hmm. take you out. They, they don't have to be better than you. If they're having a good shooting night, you're in Absolutely. trouble. Absolutely. And, and or you're having a bad one. Right. And and this team right here has a multitude of shooters. I mean, Kelvin yeah, can shoot. Tyler can shoot. Uh, Hagens has shown signs every once in a while that he can hit an outside shot if he's wide open and, and the moon is right, he can hit it. Um, we've got guys that can hit that shot. And a bunch of guys, rather than just, you know, like Fox and Monk, where we've got two guys that can drain it from outside. Right. And then, I bam, might get like, a rebound. But Right. I think teams like that can go really far in the tournament. And that's almost why I think Duke's going to slip up a little bit in the tournament because I hate to bring – back old memories but in 2009 john wall demarcus cousins we were by far the best team by far we couldn't shoot we couldn't shoot the three ball to save our life exactly duke is a little bit like that this year they dominate inside yeah they have one guy that can shoot i think they got barrett that can shoot but other than that they're an inside team and they're not a good free throw shooting team it this duke team is very similar i think to the 2009 kentucky team where they they could run into like an Auburn where Bryce Brown and Jared Harper are throwing up threes from the logo and draining them, and they can yeah. slip up. And I, I, that's why I think it could come down to a Kentucky or a Tennessee being in that national championship game because both teams can shoot so well. Yeah, I, I, I'm right there with you, and, and that that's a great comparison. I hadn't realized it, but the more I think about it, Duke has the big man that can't be stopped, DeMarcus Cousins. Yep. Duke has the NBA-ready guard who can score any way he wants, John Wall. Duke has the electric point guard that can give you a fourth answer, and uh, like we did with Eric Bledsoe. They have a Darius, which I hate to compare the two because I think Cam Reddish is much better than Darius Miller, but Cam Reddish seems like he gets lost in the shuffle 
when Zion Williams is going for 30 or when R.J. Right. Barrett's putting up 20. It just seems like he kind of he, – he kind of like is the, the wallflower at the party. You have enough entertainment. You don't need me, which in March could get you lost. Right. So – and one thing I like that I see is if you think that – now, obviously, I don't remember every game ever, but I try to keep it somewhat in my mind so I can keep on track. One thing that I like that we're seeing – I don't feel like other teams have we've other Kentucky teams have seen in the past. Teams are desperate to beat us now. Right. It felt like in the past, teams were going to play their style of basketball. And if they lost, they lost. And then right. when we came to March, we played a good team that played pesky and we couldn't get it done. This year, I'm seeing they're throwing two three zone, they're throwing three two zone. There's I, I'm seeing the one three one everywhere. Florida even ran the one three one but met us at the other three point line. Right, right. I, and we struggle. Look, I'm not, I'm not in denial, but I like that. Let, us, pra- let us practice that against a, a pesky Florida team so when a very tough Virginia team throws something at us, we've seen it before. Right, right. So I, I'm excited about that. And like I said, obviously, I've, I've said this the last couple of weeks, this team has now won my heart over. Yeah. I now, I, I, I now need to win this. I, I need them to win this year. Like, yeah. I <laughs> – as Dan Dock had said yesterday on those two free throws in the middle of just the second half, I mean, if you weren't paying attention, you'd be like, these yeah, free throws yeah. don't matter. How did he call that? I, 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 so, look, I, I said the conspiracy theory that well, I think he's from the future. No, I said this last night. I think he's, uh, I think he's trying to be the new Tony Romo. Yeah. Because he did it several times, and he was wrong. He was right. like, oh, Hagans is going to come up with a big steal. Hagans didn't. Right. Or Kentucky's going to have a great offensive play. They didn't. Or right. they're going to go on a, Florida's about to go on a run. They didn't. So, I, I think he's just – I mean, look, I, I love throwing Dan something Dock. out and hoping it sticks. Yeah, the old spaghetti theory. He's just throwing everything against the wall. If it sticks, it sticks. And, I mean, and I, look, I'm not saying he's just pulling stuff out of nowhere. I, I think his basketball expertise give – you know, played the probabilities. You know, it's, it's a good probability that if you're on a 12-point run and the crowd is now quiet because you're shooting free throws, if you miss both of those free throws, the crowd is not going to be hyped again. I mean, it, it's right. good numbers. But, I, you know, it's kind of funny like that. I think this year is those – this year for Kentucky are those free throws. If we don't win the national title this year, we don't make the Final Four this year. I think – especially if Duke does. That pretty much sets in your mind right. that it can get – it can be done with the right one and dones. Cal just hasn't had them. Right. It's it those noises that cows can't coach cow can't coach good talent, which I don't believe, gets even louder. Right. That that tie that cow wears at Kentucky gets a little tighter because yeah. the buzz around Rupp Arena knows it that you could give us Michael Jordan and can we get it done? Right. Right. And, and then I, I hate then, that for cow. I, I do. I do too because it's not deserving. I mean, I, I say this over and over. What has any other coach done that cow hasn't? Unless you're yeah. talking Adolph and, Rupp. And honestly, he should have three titles right now, oh, if, if we're being honest. He, he should have more. He should have yeah. 10, 11, 12, 14, 15, and probably 17, if we're being honest. Yeah. I yeah. mean, <laughs> but it, then it, again, you could say the same about Rick. Rick should have had 92, 93, 96, 97, and should have stayed for 98. I mean, <laughs> so, but, and, and I get it. And, and I'm very frustrated about what we've let slip away. But if, if we win this title, if basically Cal shows you and shows maybe even himself that I can take these kids and get them to play in a way that no one can stop us, that's two titles for Kentucky. That's something that only Adolph Rupp has done. Right. Oh, I think, I think we're about to see the next 10 years of glory. I think – it's so funny. I think we could see what we saw from Duke, what we saw from Tom Brady, where you think it's over, where you think the run's done, and then we grab three in four years. Yes, I, I, I truly I think that. I, I, I truly think that, man. I I agree, and 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 almost this this team is even more special because you know we have some of these guys this year that probably aren't going to be one and done. If we're being honest with ourselves, I mean, Tyler, for instance, he is a great player. He's probably not a one and done. He's probably at least two years. So Hagens uh, might uh, be uh, the same way. Let me ask you about Tyler though, because I get it. Like Tyler. I, I see a lot in Tyler, and I feel like that is a two-year guy. Mm-hmm. But I also – the NBA is lending itself to where guys like Tyler can play crazy. Let, <laughs> let me just tell you how his career is going to go 
if he falls just enough to get picked up by the Golden State Warriors. Right. I, I, look, I hope he comes back, and you're absolutely right. And please let him come back. Right. Because I, I think I think mentally he's got a lot of growing to do. He played at a small school in Wisconsin. He really wasn't on the AAU scene. He wasn't a McDonald's All American. Like he, he. That's why I took it. Think it took him so long to get going because he right. was like, "Oh crap, these guys were good." Yeah. So I hope he comes back. Hey, I think, do you think, I think he comes he, back. I, I do. I think I think he comes back. I actually think Hagens comes back quickly yes. to come back. Oh. We're, gonna, we're gonna get a junior Nick Richards. You pre- oh. prepare yourself for that. You know. I, I Sophomore E. J. Montgomery, does that happen? Yeah, that's gonna happen. And I I'll tell you what, EJ was was impressive last night. I think EJ's been impressive just about every time he's he's hit the floor. I mean, he doesn't provide much offense, but rebounding and defensively he can give you he can give you minutes. Let me ask you this then, because you're you're in just as many Kentucky groups as I am. You see everything gets shared. You see all the comments. Sometimes you can't eat your cake and have it both. Sometimes you can't marry the girl next door and flirt with the prom queen. Right. Sometimes you can't do both. So I see a lot of people post. I see a lot of Kentucky fans, very passionate Kentucky fans, very good Kentucky fans. I see them say, oh, man, I hope, like you just said, I hope Hero and Hagens and, and Quickly and, and EJ and Nick, and I, and I hope they all return. But at the same token, you're saying, man, I hope we get Matthew Hunt. Man, I hope we get Anthony Edwards. Man, I hope we get this big man. Well, you're not going to get both. Right. You're not going to get – and, and my, trust me, man, I would rather have – even Nick Richards, I've been tough on him. I would rather have junior Nick Richards than any other big outside of the Wiseman kid that went to – Memphis. Right. I mean, I think I just don't think there's many good bigs. Right. So you're going to risk running him off for another scale, another project? No. Right. Give right. us it. So I get it. I get, and it, that's why when when the big man that committed to Washington, everybody was like, oh, I don't get why Cal's losing his touch. Cal's not losing his touch. The kid just decided sooner. Right. There's no Anthony Davis on this team. There's no. There's no guarantee. The only big man I guarantee we're losing is Reed Travis because he's a senior. He has to go. Right. Right. I mean, even P.J. Washington, if he has a blast, in theory, could come back. Yeah, in theory, yes. So, it's, it's a very tough spot, but don't blame that on Cal because kids are deciding sooner. Yes, I, I agree 100% you know, with you. Uh, uh, we've, we've seen over the years, sometimes it takes longer, but the light bulb usually tends to always come on for these guys. Even Scal right now, yeah, he went way before we wanted him to go because – he didn't really have that great of a year, but he's doing well in the NBA right now. And, and, he, and I, I, I think we will eventually come on for Nick Richards. Look at Willie Colley. I mean, Willie Colley Stein, he struggled mightily for a couple yeah. years. And light bulb came on for him. I think Nick Richards can be that type of guy, minus the outside three point shooting. Right. <laughs> yeah. I don't think well, he's going to start threes. But like the NBA prepares you for that. So maybe he could. I mean, look at look at Boogie. Look at Demarcus Cousins. The kid kills threes. I mean, he's. I think since going to the Warriors, he's shooting like fifty percent. Yeah, like, he, he never did that at Kentucky because it doesn't lend itself to doing that. Right. One thing, one thing I say. Look at Jamal Murray. Everybody, when when that draft came out, they took every guard before John Mar- Jamal Murray that they could. Right. And look what he's doing. Right. So I've said this a hundred times, and I'm going to say it literally every t- opportunity. I get. I want your opinion. I do honestly. I want your opinion on it. But I, I, I want this word out because I feel like this is something a lot of people don't look at. When people hit you with the blanket statement that Cal's a good recruiter, but he can't coach. So we're going to hold that mindset in our thoughts, and then I, I want to ask you a moral question too, with with what we expect of our coaches, what we expect from our kids. Right. I think Cal is a great coach. I, I he's just, he's just coaching a different class than everyone else is taking. Example, Cal doesn't coach zone. You know why? Because the NBA doesn't run zone. Right. Cal doesn't coach baby sets where literally everybody's moving. I mean, I'm sure he has some plays, don't get me wrong, but he doesn't coach these college-type sets like Virginia does. Right. You know why? Because the NBA doesn't run those. Right. If The, the point that I realized this was one of the, the most heartbreaking points that I, I can remember. 2015, we had a six-point lead on Wisconsin and got back-to-back – or had three straight turnovers, back-to-back shot clock violations. Right. 
because instead of doing what college teams do, where you give it in to Carl Anthony Towns and let him score, right. Cal did what the NBA teams do. Yep. Let the point guard dribble until late in the shot clock and then let your point guard play. That's what Cal tries to do with these kids. Cal says, I could hold your hand and walk you through these plays, or I could let you figure it out because you're going to be better for it. That loss to Wisconsin, the way he played that whole tournament run where Andrew Harrison, even though he was by far not the best player on that team, got to call the shots is the entire reason I think Andrew Harrison has it in an NBA career. Yes. Because what Cal taught him. Yeah. Cal, in my opinion, Cal's a great coach. Yeah. He's just coaching you things you're going to need in the future. Right. And, and I agree. And anybody that ever brings up the Cal can't coach uh, opinion to me, all you have to do is look at the Harrison Twins team that made the championship run. That team had no business being in the national championship. Absolutely not. But they got better as the season went out. Even the Brandon Knight team, we were a four seed. And, mm -hmm. man, that was a fun tournament, wasn't it? Knocking off it Ohio was. State and Jared Selinger with Josh Harrelson being one of our main characters. <laughs> exactly. With, so that, that proves it right there that Cal can coach. So let me ask you this then. I, I don't know what your family situation is. I don't know if you have kids. I don't know if you ever intend on having kids. But let's just pretend you do. And pretend you're old and your kids are, are, are 18, 19. And your kid says, Dad, I want to be a writer like you. So you send him to a good college where he's going to be a good writer, a good media guy. And he comes home on summer break and he tells you, guess what they taught me? And you're like, that's wrong. You should not be taught. That's not how you write. That's not how you create content. I, I don't feel like you're being taught the right stuff. So you call his professor and you say, Professor, why did you teach my son this? And the professor says, well, he may not be able to use that in the real world, but it made my numbers look good. It got me a new job. It got me renewed tenure at this university. Right. You would flip your lid. Right. You would go nuts. You would, you would withdraw your son from that university so quick and probably have a lawsuit pending. Right. <laughs> Why do we hold sports to the other end of the spectrum? Okay. Nobody said – when, when uh, Urban Meyer came out and said, it's not my job to develop Tim Tebow as a passer, it's my job to develop Florida into a championship team. No, it's not. It's your job to develop these kids into their future. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like yep. Bobby Petrino did the same thing with Lamar Jackson. It's not my job to make him a passer. It's my job to win games for Florida. And everybody gets behind that. Right. But where, what is the job of these coaches? Is it to win games for the university and the fans like me and you? Or is it, in Cal's case, to prepare these kids – for their actual careers, because typically at least 50% of the kids that put on a Kentucky jersey nowadays, this is their, this is their job interview. Like right. their, This is their job. Their future of putting food on the table is in the NBA. Right. Yeah, and Cal's, so, a, Cal's an innovator that way because you, you don't see many coaches doing that. No. You don't see many coaches, you know, giving up kind of – I hate to say this, but giving up championships and giving up titles – to make sure that the kids are ready for the next step rather than the university, you know, getting the glory. The kids are getting the glory. He, he's an and, innovator in that. Exactly. And I think he's authentic. He, he's yeah. true to that. He doesn't just do it. He doesn't just do it as a recruiting tactic. I think he truly believes that. Yeah. And, th and I think that's why Cal has this second run in him. That's why I think Cal's going to win two or three more titles because everybody else on the outside says, hey, I can do it like Cal does but I'm not going to be as, as authentic. Right. And that's why everybody says, oh, there's been two teams in the last, I think, 30 years that have been number, been top 10 in the recruiting class and won the title that year. 2012 Kentucky, 2015 Duke. Right. That shows you how hard it is to do this. Kansas has been chasing the same one and dones we have, and every year they have a guy that has to sit out because of violations. Right. Duke's now trying to do it. And I've told you, I'm going to steal what Matt Jones said, and I'm going to take it on next farther. Matt Jones said earlier in the season, this is the team that Duke has the team Kentucky has, and Kentucky has the team Duke has. Right. If you, if you look at the roster, yes. if you think four NBA All-Stars, you think that's Kentucky roster. You see a bunch of uh, solid guys who could potentially make a roster, that's typically Duke. Yep. This year, this year is so important to me as a fan because, like I said, if Kentucky loses in the Sweet 16 – and Duke wins the national title, I have questions. Now right. I have to reconsider some things that I think we're doing as a program. Right. 
But if Kentucky wins the national title and Duke loses anywhere before the Final Four, man, what does that tell you? That tells you that Cal is that dude. Right. That tells you Cal can win with your team, but you can't win with my team. Right. There's always been a, one of my favorite sayings I heard a coach say, I'm so good I can beat you with my team, then I can take your team and beat you with my team. Exactly, yeah. Like, that's great. And, and it's almost, and it's almost kind of neat, too, because, you know, this one-and-done rule is getting ready to change. And I feel like Cal has got more energy now, and he's, he's kind of got a second burst of energy. I feel like we're kind of gradually going away from the big top-tier one-and-done because that's college basketball. It's changing right now. Exactly. So, in, in two years when that rule does change, and Duke's still going after these top-tier guys like we used to, and now Cal's got the Tyler Heroes and the Manuel Quickleys and EJ Montgomerys that are going to stick around for a little while. Where's that going to leave Duke, and where's that going to leave us? You know, I I really, hey. I really think Cal is kind of changing his philosophy here and recreating himself again towards the college basketball environment. Man, I, I love that thought because I'm right there with you. What do great coaches do? They rebuild without you knowing they're rebuilding. Right. I, I've heard fans say, and, and haters, and, and Kentucky, people who don't like Kentucky, whatever you want to call them, and, and they've said, I want to see Cal win without talent. I want to see Cal get guys that's going to stay a couple years. That doesn't happen overnight because of the process of opportunity. Right. Look at the guys Cal's recruited typically who Eric Bledsoe wasn't ranked in the recruitings. He was a one and done. Right. We got, uh, what was his name? The, the, uh, the, the kid that we got the second year. I'm drawing a blank on his name. He ended up going to Georgia Tech. He said, like, he didn't play, so he transferred. Willie Cauley-Stein, Kyle Wilcher. These are guys that Cal intends on staying for a long time, but they bounce. Right, right. Two th- last year's team, I think, was the revolutionary team. It was the team that Cal went to the middle of the barrel. Yeah. He, he rushed down. He reached down deeper than the top, and he grabbed guys. I think Kevin Knox fell on his lap, but he grabbed guys. Shea, Green. Vanderbilt, tip, guys who are undersized or oversized, and, and Shay's point because he was just like real tall and lanky, right? And basically said, "You're undersized. You're you're good, but you're not good enough. We're going to build this for a couple of years." Yeah. Some guys left that shouldn't. I don't think Hami should left, but I don't think he really brought much. Yeah. Vanderbilt left after playing just a couple games. Right. But I think that was Cal turning the page. I I, Cal, I agree. And if, if you're right, man, if, if if you hit the nail on the head, and even if we win a title, and let's just say we win the title and P.J., Keldon, and Hagens is gone because the NBA loves guard defensive point guards. Right. That means we have a starting lineup of quickly. Hero, with Baker coming off the bench, will probably have to start that maxi kid, but apparently he's real legit. We'll have E.J. at the four, Nick Richards at the five. Right. Right, and there's I'm, no telling what big man will get to back him exactly, up. Exactly. That could eventually yeah. midseason turn into a player. So, and, and I hate to say this, but I only this is the only way I can compare it. I love what North Carolina is doing, where they get guys who are four- and five-star, but you just don't see them on any mock drafts. Right. So they, they get to the Final Four, they bring everybody back. They right. win a national championship, they bring 80% of the people back. Right. They get to another Final Four, they bring everybody back. That's and I think that's what Cal's doing. And, I, and, and you hit the nail on the head. I hadn't thought of it in that words. And it was, it was beautifully written, man. You should write a whole article on it. I would love to read it. <laughs> but Cal is ahead. That when in two years, when that one and done's gone, and like you said, Coach K's knocking on doors of guys who's already hired an agent, and Cal's got his team built. Right. I just, man, that's why I enjoy talking to you. I feel like we, we share the same thoughts. I just hope the fan base gives him that chance. I yep. hope they don't. You know, with that thought process, you, you seem like a an, an extremely nice guy. Well, but you said, <laughs> and you said you write articles that make you get out of the make you get out of the mindset a little bit of the norm. Let's ruffle some feathers here. What is one thing that you see our fan base do that drives you wild? That just makes you so mad that you just want to kick something? Oh. Uh- for me, it's it's hands down the early season losses. I can't I, I can't even look at social media or anything after that because we're we're just ripping the team, and it's been proven that Cal Perry's going to have the boys fine come come February March. He, he he's always proved that even even when we were really 
bad, you know, and not that great. He still had us playing our best basketball at that time, the best basketball that we were capable of playing with that personnel we had. And and that's that's one thing that I that really gets me, like the Seton Hall loss. Look, somebody went off. I mean, that guy had a game of his life. That exactly. Going to stop that? You know. No. We stopped it for a half. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Look, dude, if you could see, I am fist pumping right now because I am right there with you. The the circle of griping that that sometimes and look, this is just a, a small percentage of the fan base as a whole, right. but it's the loudest, it's the squeakiest wheel. Yes. The circle of griping that that just makes me infuriated because, like you said, it starts early. And every it, every game that we lost with probably the exception of Duke, actually helped us. Seton Hall, we lost that game in overtime. Guess what? We beat someone in overtime the next time when they had a they had a shot for a three, and they missed absolutely. it. Absolutely. Alabama, Abs- we lost the first SEC road game. We haven't lost one since, have we? We've learned how to play on the road. Absolutely. Man, Every you loss are, has helped yes. us, this team grow. Say it louder for the people in the back. Yes. Hey, and I'm <laughs> and I'm and I'm right there with you. That Knox, that game at Knoxville, that is going to be tough. That environment's going to be rocking. It's already been said it's going to be at eight o'clock on a Saturday. They're probably going to have game day there. Game day will oh, probably absolutely. be in Knoxville for the first time, and I can't even imagine when game day was in Knoxville. And we because, we could very realistically take a major punch to the gut in that game, I, but I think it'll help. Absolutely, because you look at those games. We're sitting here with three losses. We lost to – we beat Auburn. We lost to Alabama. We beat Kansas. Right. Those Alabama and Seton Hall losses aren't even going to make their way to a talking point. When Selection Sunday's on and they're talking about good wins versus bad losses, they're going to brush through that Alabama and Seton Hall. Now, the Duke loss is obviously going to stand because it made so much noise. Right. But those other two are just going to be brushed over like a glaze, just gone. Yeah. And – Opposed to you win those games, but you lose to Auburn and, and Kansas, and people's like, "Well, can you win the big one? Can you get it done against good teams?" Right? No, they know we can. Right. And and and, and my point of the circle of griping, man, it gets me so infuriated because we lose early, and everybody comes out and trust me, this is this is not my feelings, but this is just what I hear. We lost early. We lost to Duke. We lost to Seton Hall. All I heard was, "Hagen's is too young. Heroes overrated." PJ's trash. Nick's horrible. Reed Travis is the only good person we have on this team. Right. Then Cal and everybody works hard together. They get in that. They work their butt off, man. I can only imagine those practices and the effort they put in. Right. They lose one game on the road, which had its fair good shooter. I mean, he just yeah. the, the kid was like eight for eight in the first quarter, or yeah. first half. Yeah, yeah, and he hadn't played like that all year. <laughs> right. Dude played out of his mind, and we hadn't beat and we we'd beat Alabama ten straight times. He was hungry. Yeah. And then all I hear is cows overrated, can't win with elite talent. Well, first off, this uh, now this team's elite. Yeah. Because which is it? Either Cal can't coach elite talent, or this team's trash and everybody's overrated, but Cal's got them playing pretty darn good. Exactly. Which is it? And then we get to the point right now where we're all peace, love, and holding each other's hands and singing kumbaya because life's great. And let's just say we don't win the title. Then everybody's going to come with Cal can't get it done with one and done. Guess what? No one else can. I miss the old. That, I, I mentioned this earlier. I mention this every time I get a chance because anytime I hear, I miss the old days of Kentucky. What are the old days you are missing? Are you missing Adolf Rupp on the radio? Because I know you're not missing Joe B. Hall. Yeah. I know you're not missing uh, who's Eddie Sutton. I know you're not missing Tubby and, and Gillespie. So who are you missing? Are you missing yeah. Rick? Because these Rick Rick's run and Cal's run. Is the exact same, really. Couple Final Fours, national championship, and some upsetting Elite Eight losses. Only thing is, Cal hasn't broke your heart by going pro for a year and then going to your rival. Right. So who are you missing? That, that's the question I got to ask. Who are you missing? Did John Wooden coach here? And I don't know it. <laughs> exactly. Was 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 I know I was born in '89, but was the '80s that good? Was the '80s the we won eight titles in nine years? Is that how that went? Yeah. See, I, I speak for that either. I was '88, <laughs> man. So I, 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 I don't know what people were talking about when they say they miss it. Like, look, I get if you're fresh. I get if, if one and done is not your style. Because let's be honest, Kentucky doesn't really pump out that much talent, the state. Right. And I, I mean, no disrespect. But though, I mean, the Spalding kid at Louisville, 
That was the best of the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. Derek Willis and Hawkins was great for our teams. Yeah. But you don't, is that who you want leading your team? Yeah. Because I guarantee you if Cal or we bring – let's say we bring in some guy that coaches at Kentucky and he wants to recruit local talent. Hope you all enjoy the Sweet 16. Yeah. That's all it's going to be. Right. All right, man. <laughs> we got to slow down here. The rants are raving. I'm, I'm breaking a sweat. Let's, let's peek ahead to Tuesday here real quick. Like, South Carolina, Frank Martin's going to have them playing pesky. If I'm not mistaken, it's a home game. It's back at Rupp. What's your takes away? Give me your takes. Give me your fears. Give me your outcome. Well, first off, I, I just got to say, I absolutely love watching those smaller SEC schools in basketball when they got one guy that is head and shoulders above the the rest, like a Yonte Mayton or a Devin Downey. And Silva is one, just a great player, and he is so much fun to watch. But outside of him, you know, they got Coach Sart and Haas can shoot the ball from outside, and they've got the – five-star kid that hadn't really turned into a five-star kid. I can't think of his name right now. He's number 24. You know, they're like you said, they're pesky. They're going to slow the game down. They're going to try to get the ball into Silva. Um, I do think we're going to struggle with that for a while because we struggle with length, and Silva is pretty tall. But they're just not as deep as, as we are, and I, I just don't think they're as talented as we are. I think we'll end up pulling away in the end, but I do think it'll be close for a little bit. But then again, I also said that about Vanderbilt. <laughs> that, didn't turn, <laughs> that didn't turn out. Nobody can be mad at, at you for that Vanderbilt idea because, look, I even thought it because it was at Vandy. We like, always play terrible there. Yeah, everything. So I, I found out that that was the biggest road win in Cal's history like or, at Kentucky. Like, wow. Yeah. And, and then I was, I was impressed seeing Johnny David in blue. Right. Because typically he doesn't play in road games because we just don't put him away and he's got to. Wow. So, yeah. the way I see this South Carolina game going, I, I see this lot being what we saw a little while ago. I think they come out early. I think I wouldn't be surprised if early on they're up like 12 4. Yeah. Then we go on a run. We go into halftime up six. Second half, we get a 12 14 point lead early. A couple of big threes. Then we do what young teams do when life's good. And you start chillaxing because you think you got it. Mm -hmm. I think they trim it down to about four, maybe even close. When we, I I think it's a a less than a five point game going into that four o'clock timeout. But then we come out and we're like, "Oh crap, we got to play!" And and we get a, I I think, eight to fourteen point win. My fear, if I had a fear, would be that we come out too big, we jump out to a twenty point lead in the first half. Going into halftime, it's whittled down to 10. And then in the second half, we have someone who has no business going nuts, going nuts. Because I think, like you said, they have one guy who's only really good, and I think Cal's going to take him away. But if someone else steps up and goes nuts, then you've got to account for him on the fly, which means he's already hot, which means Silva's now ready to get going. Yeah. My fear is that, that going into the fourth quarter, they're on like a – 30 to eight run and we're tied and it's just too hard to turn it around because momentum's like a semi truck, man. Sometimes it is not easy to stop. Right. Right. Well, the good new, the good thing about this game coming up is it's at Rupp, um, South Carolina. They have weapons, but they don't have many weapons. They got a couple guys that can shoot from the outside and AJ Lawson, uh, the guy's name I was forgetting was uh, Keyshawn Bryan. I had to look it up cause I can't just forget a name. There you go. Haas guy. They can shoot from the outside. But other than that, like I said, they're not very deep. Um, I think Silva is going to be a threat down low, and I think Silva is going to be Silva. He's going to have, you know, 15 to 20 points somewhere around there. But I just don't think they have the offensive firepower to keep up with us. So, how how much? You don't have to give me a final score, but give me an area that you think we win by. Is it more than five, more than 10? I, I think we win this next game just because it's at Rupp. I think we're going to win it by more than 10. But I do think it's going to be I, – I do. it'll have to be our guards because I think Silva is going to give us a problem down low. We, we, always, struggle okay. with, we always struggle with length, and he's, he's lengthy. There ain't no doubt about that. Absolutely. So, great call. Hey, man, it, it's been great. A couple of wrapping up questions here. I know you're not a big NBA guy, but I, I enjoy the Kentucky fan base because we're a mixture of new and old moralities. 
Right. We, we cherish our own. Anyone who's ever donned the UK blue, we hold them in such high regard, but we're still very old school with our thoughts and our, and our uh, expectations. Right. So we have Anthony Davis. The man won a title for us. One of, he, he's up there in, in the all-time greats in Kentucky lore. Wants out of a contract, wants to go somewhere where he can win. Yep. I know. What's your thoughts on this? I mean, you don't have to give me what you think he's going to do, but are you okay with this? It, it, does – does your loyalty to Anthony Davis say, hey, I want him to be happy? Or does your, hey, he signed a contract, he needs to live it out? What, just what's your thoughts on that situation? Yeah, I can't remember who actually said this. And I might be just dreaming that someone said this, and I was thinking it. But um, every Kentucky player, because we get drafted so high, because we're one and dones, they're going to teams that aren't very good. So we don't get to see – these Kentucky mm-hmm. guys, it might have been Matt Jones that said this. I don't know who said it. But we don't get to see these Kentucky guys playing in the big NBA games because we're, we're on the lower teams because we were taken so high in the draft. I'd love for Anthony Davis to get a chance to go play with LeBron. I think that I, – I don't watch the NBA, but that would make me watch the NBA to see Anthony yeah. Davis and LeBron. That would be, that would be fun. And well, I, hope, I hope we can get more guys on, on the good teams like Cousins is on the Warriors. Yeah. Now. Well, that's what I'm about to say. I think that's the first one. And uh, – I'm a big NBA guy, so there's a there's a tide changing in the NBA, and and I think you're going to see an uptick of your Kentucky players getting more love because what basically has now become is there's only like five good teams in the NBA. Right. Everybody else is kind of a developmental team, so good team drafts good player, like Carl Anthony Towns. Carl Anthony Towns goes to Minnesota, gets drafted, gets to play all he wants, gets all the money he wants, but in three or four years. He's going to go somewhere else because it's, it's like a checklist. Get playing time, get money, get championship ring. Yeah. Get your, get your feet wet, get acclimated with the system, and yep. then let's go get some rings. Yeah. Absolutely. Make, make, sure, make sure, you know, sign that one $200 million contract. Make sure you are set for life no matter what happens, and then you go chase that ring. Because I'm telling you, and look, everybody gets mad at quote unquote super teams. Even if it's not an NBA fan, I'm sure you've heard that term slung around there. Right, right. These kids are changing. I mean, Anthony Davis, for example, this is where I found myself defending Anthony Davis. And I don't like LeBron. I don't like the Lakers. And I hope he don't go there. But it's all signs point that he will. Everybody says, why is, NBA want, why is Anthony Davis wanting to be this type of kid? Well, he played at a horrible sh- Chicago high school. Right. When he, but when he's found success, he found a common factor. When he won AAU, he played with the likes of the other greats, Austin Rivers, uh, Bradley Bill. When he played with – when he played at Kentucky and won a title, he was playing with the second best recruit in the country, Michael Kidd Gilchrist, and a Marcus Teague and a Terrence Jones. So now he's in the NBA. He's made all the money. He's won a lot of the accolades, getting all the numbers he wants. Well, now it's time for him to win a ring. Right. Well, the only way he's won a ring before is playing with other great guys. You're going to do what you do. Right. And I'm telling you now, I don't know what team might be the Knicks. I don't know where. I mean, a lot of things come into factor. But in five years, when LeBron's kind of done, kind of winding down, don't be surprised if you see Devin Booker and Carlton Towns on the same team. Yeah. And that's going to be a good team. Yeah, that'll be fun, that'll be fun to watch, no doubt. Right. Well, the environment has changed. The, these, these pros, regardless of what sport, because I'm a big baseball guy, the, the days are gone where you stay with the same team forever. You know, the Ma- Greg Maddox and Tom Glavin, to throw a Braves example in there, they were never going to leave the Braves. It didn't matter if the Yankees no. came calling. They were not going to leave the Braves. And gone are the days of players just staying in the place that they were drafted because that's their home now. You know? Well, you know, I'll take it a step farther for you. The, gone are the days of that in life. It's not even just teams. Yeah. You know, I, I've had two I, – I went to college for a little bit. didn't turn into anything. I've had two career influences in my life. One was my grandpa who worked three jobs in his entire year, in his life. And they were, at, he would join the Navy and then he came out and he stayed at two factories each 30 years apiece. Like he just, you know, just did that. Right. And then my last boss that I had, a very successful, great leader. The man don't stay anywhere more than five years because, and I, and I talked to him about this. I said, you know, I was talking to my grandpa, you find a job that pays you and you stay there until they'll no longer pay you. Right. And he said, that's not how this works anymore. You play there until you reach your links, to you reach your max, to you reach your ceiling, and then you take your experiences and lessons learned, and you go take it somewhere else because then you're ready to lead at a new level with a new group of people. That's life now. Exactly. 
if if you're set up, and, and I don't mean to turn this into like just a Dr. Phil podcast, but I would be willing to say if anything you do in life, whether you're working at McDonald's, whether you're trying to be a content provider, whether you're working at a law firm, or whether you're an all-star athlete, if you're with the mindset that you're in the same place you're going to be for the next 50 years, you're probably setting yourself up to fail. Right. So one last question. I got We do a thing at the end of every show where we go through – the games and just real quick, you pick a winner, but you said something there I want to touch on. And and it's been an honor having you on. That's why we're running a little longer, but it's it's like, it's like having a new toy. It's a new conversation. It's new answers. It's new response. Yeah. Baseball guy. You're a baseball guy. To me, baseball is the most stubborn sport out there. Do you think baseball needs to change? Just real quick. Do you think, do you think they need to be okay? They need to throw out those unwritten rules, no bat flip, no this, no that, if they want to continue to stay relevant and keep up with the likes of NFL, NBA, even hockey and soccer that seems to be trying to creep in ways. Right. Does baseball have to update some of their game? Well, they're moving towards that of where they're updating because just 10 years ago, if you put a shift on somebody and your third baseman was playing over behind second base, the players would bunt down the third baseline and take their base hit. Now they won't do that. They'll hit right into the shift trying to hit a home run because it looks cool, and it yeah. filters up the box score. But I I think baseball is actually past the point now where they're going to try to compete with football and, and basketball. They're just like, okay, you know what? Y'all have your, your shining moment. We'll be back one day. Um, and, and they're fine with where they're at. I think they do need to change a couple things, but I, but I don't think they're going to make a major change anytime soon because baseball that like you said they're stubborn they're it, it's it's almost like the uh, i just watched a parks and recreation episode <laughs> where the andy dwyer said i just on my bucket list i want to sit on first class and as people walk by i just want to go <laughs> that's almost like baseball they just want to sit there and they just want to laugh at you no we're in our own world don't worry about us so well i actually look at it more too like an upcoming musician i know baseball's been here a while but when you get a band that's on the verge of being popular. Yeah. You often come into one or two things. You either keep making the music that made you popular, but maybe only 20% of the people like that, or you risk trying to make the other 80% happy. And if the 80% aren't happy and your 20% that liked you before don't like the new stuff, now you have 0% popularity. Right. So right. I think there is something to be said that if you're the M- MLB and you try to go so progressive to keep up with the MLB or the NFL and the NBA and you tick off the 50% fans you do have and the 50% new fans you're trying to get still don't care. Now you have no fans. Right. right. So, I mean, I, I, that's a good point. You just kind of, sometimes you just take your fan base and you say, Hey, this is who I am. Yeah. This is what I do. So let's, uh, let's go through the games here. Yeah. You already said that you already said that you're giving South Carolina a win. Basically real quick. I'm just going to say a team. You say win or loss, and we're going to see what your season looks like at the end. At Mississippi State. Ooh, I think we're going to win it, but I think it's going to be tough. LSU at home. If this game was on the road, we would lose this game at LSU because LSU has two big guys down low in Nas Reed and their other post guy, and they're tough, man. But it's at home. I think we're going to win this one. Tennessee at home. I think we'll win that because game day is going to be there. It's a big game environment. I think we're going to come out pumped. At Missouri. We'll win that. Auburn at home. I think we'll win, but I think that's going to be tough. Auburn can go off at any moment. Arkansas. I think we'll win that one. At Tennessee. I, we talked about it earlier. I don't think we're going to win this game at Tennessee. I think we're going to split with them. And I'm okay with it. I'm okay Ole Miss. With too. I have it written here that it's at home, but I think it's on the road. Yeah, so We're going to go Ole Miss at, at Oxford. Yeah, it's on the road. I, I okay. think we're going to win that. This team plays better on the road than they do at home. I'll take. They did not look impressive against Iowa State. I'll, I'll give you that. They did. I, I was not because that's the only time I've watched them. Iowa State, and I noticed they was ranked. Right. They laid an egg out there. They're the typical and, SEC West team. Like when it was East and West, and you knew if you were going over to play a West team, they're going to jack up fifty threes. That's typical Ole Miss right there. That, <laughs> that is old do. school. They're that is jack, old school SEC ness. They're going to jack up some threes. Is what they're going to do. And Florida at home rematch. I think we'll win this one. I, I think Florida got a little shell shocked by us, and I think they'll be shell shocked at the end of the year when they come into Rough on Senior Day, celebrating Reed Travis Day. <laughs> yes, that, that that that's great. That will be Reed Travis Day because uh, <laughs> there, there isn't a 
a Sam Malone, a John Smith. There isn't those got guy coming off the bench either. It's it's just Reed Travis. It is Reed Travis. Um, so much like me, you have us finishing the regular season twenty seven and four, which I think would be outstanding. Yes, I do too. Just off the top of your head, well, we'll kind of talk through this a little bit. I think the SEC tournament run just kind of—I always feel like there's a formula. It's always set up that we play some team. I think we'll play Bama in the first round. Yeah. Then I think we'll play Auburn, Tennessee for the win of the SEC championship. Is, is that something you could see happening? I I could see that happening. Um, I it's going to be really hard to beat Tennessee in the SEC tournament. And I, this is going to be an unpopular opinion, but I think Tennessee is going to win the SEC tournament because at the end of Tennessee's schedule, we mentioned it way earlier on the show, they're going to take some lumps at the end of the season, and they're going to yeah. come into the SEC tournament. They're going to come in hungry. And whereas we're, I think, looking at our schedule, I think we're going to win, you know, five out of the last six games, so we're not going to be as hungry as maybe a team that just lost. The, Tennessee's last game of the year is at Auburn. That's going to be a tough one to win. And if they don't win that, I think they're going to come into the tournament hungry. They're a veteran team. It's going to be tough to topple them in the tournament. But I do think it'll be Tennessee, Kentucky in the championship game. And any can, anything can happen in that championship game. So let me ask you this. If both of us finish the stretch, uh, there's roughly 10 games left. If both of us finish the stretch 9-1, and one, let's say Tennessee doesn't take their lumps. They don't come in hungry. They come in full. They've been dominating. Do you still see them being that of uh, – progressive that that aggressive in the sec tournament championship i think if tennessee only loses one more game and it's at rup for the rest of their year i think we will win the sec tournament then but here's the problem we match up perfectly with tennessee every you can go down the list every player they have we got <coughs> we've got an answer for that player with the exception of kyle alexander their big guy down low he doesn't provide much offense but man he averages like double figures in rebounds he is a rebounding machine and he's and he's tall and lanky and that's what we struggle with unless well, nick richards or ej has an epiphany and is able to guard him we're gonna struggle i think down low against them and and that's why i love watching these games and i can't wait because nick richards right now and i've said this a lot when he's when he gets to be get big he is good right but when he has to be good He's not really good, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, does right. that make sense? Like, whenever when the biggest guy on their team six foot eight, he's good. Right. But when they have a seven footer or someone equally as athletic, he looks clumsy. Yes, and so uh, him or EJ are going to be huge in that in the Tennessee games that we play because Kyle Alexander is really the only guy we don't match up with. Ashton Hagens matches up with Bone. They're both speedy. They're both fast. Bone's a better shooter than Hagens, but Hagens is a better defender than Bone is. And I think Schofield, I think P.J. Washington can guard Schofield all day. Reed Travis can guard Grant Williams. Our guards can definitely guard their guards on the wings, but the key, the X factor is their big seven-footer Alexander. We, we don't really have a guy that can stop that since Richards is kind of, yeah, you know, you never know. <laughs> you know. Hey, that is something, you know, I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of a lot of things. I'm a huge fan of Kentucky, and I put all my attention into that one seed. You bring an aspect to this. You named everybody on Tennessee's roster, and I only knew Scar- Schofield and Williams. <laughs> right. Loving that. I'm loving that. So, one last thing I want to touch on, and, and the things just keep coming to my head. That's why the show keeps getting longer, guys. Thanks for everybody who's staying with us. <laughs> Thank you for, Darren, I didn't for keep, taking time. I didn't keep it at half an hour. Sorry. You did not. I, I am fine. <laughs> I am fine with that. Everybody keeps saying – so I don't like – every team does it, and you can't fit with every team. But I don't like all the time when people's like, oh, we're against – everybody's against Kentucky. ESPN hates Kentucky. The, the committee hates Kentucky. The refs hate Kentucky. Because I'll be honest with you, I think that's not true at all. I think right. they love Kentucky. I agree. But, but at the end of the day – you're looking at Kentucky as a team, as a, an enjoyment, as a pleasure. They're looking at Kentucky as a cash cow. Right. I think ESPN loves Kentucky. It just so happens to say if Kentucky's struggling, they're going to take an advantage to talk about that right. because right. they know Big Blue's going to be listening. Right. It just so I happens agree. that Duke, hap- Duke happens to have the guys. And, yeah, when <laughs> it's ironic when Kentucky, most of our Kentucky guys – had pro careers and then didn't go into media. And most Duke guys did go into media. I mean, you got Jay Williams, you got Jay Billis. Like, 
that's going to happen. But the committee, the committee, I don't think they hate Kentucky. They don't want Kentucky to fail, but they know that Kentucky is going to get packed houses, full view TVs. So why would you not make the run? Because there's no guarantee you're going to get Kentucky Duke in the championship game. There's no guarantee. Yeah. Why would you not put? I wouldn't be surprised if they put us in the same bracket as Duke. Yeah, I'm. That's what. Just, that's one of my fears. I wouldn't be surprised if we lose one more game, or if we lose two more games, if they don't find a way to get put us as a four seed in the Duke bracket. So you're guaranteed that Duke matchup even sooner. Yeah. Well, I, I I think our wins are big enough. We've got an impressive too. tournament resume. I, I think if the SEC was down this year, they would definitely take an opportunity to do that. Right. This is my vision when we're hosting that trophy up. This is how I think they want us to march through the madness. They're, they're going to have us play some small team, probably pretty close to us, maybe a Western Kentucky, maybe a, a Northern Kentucky. I don't know how, what their records are. I could see them wanting us to play them in the first round. A Memphis, let's say we're the one seed. I could see them wanting Memphis at eight seed because they see this brewing. They see yeah. this Kentucky, Memphis, Cal's old school versus Penny thing brewing. Right. They, I wouldn't be surprised if they put, especially if Indiana can pull off a couple more wins, putting them at the four or five, trying to get that Kentucky, Indiana Sweet 16. Right. Would not be surprised if the two seed in our brackets, North Carolina, getting yep. another, the team with the two most Final Four appearances, putting them right there in the Elite Eight, hopefully one of them's going to battle. And I wouldn't be surprised if we don't play Michigan or Tennessee in that bottom bracket, and then Evan, you know, trying to set up the Kentucky Duke. I mean, that sounds that sounds like the gauntlet they would want us to go through. And when I see that, I get flustered because that sucks. Right. But I don't think they hate us. I just think they're trying to make a lot of money off of us. Yeah. Anytime you got those big teams, sorry, I just had a phone call beep in there. Anytime you have a big name school like that, big fan base, I mean, they're going to set it up to where you're going to you're going to get some good matchups. I think last year they did us a favor, though. I do think last year we had a very easy route. We just kind of dropped the ball, per se. We did. And if you look at it, actually, you know, everybody complains about it, but you really shouldn't. Yeah. Because Cal gets his team. By the time March gets here, Cal is ready for big-name teams. Look at it every year. Who beat us in 2010? West Virginia. What? Right. 2011. We beat Ohio. We beat Ohio State, arguably the best team in the country. Yeah. We beat North Carolina. Right. We run into UConn. 2014's even worse. You beat undefeated Wichita State. You beat your rival, defending national champions Louisville. You beat Wisconsin and Michigan. Yep. The worst team you face the entire tournament is in the is UConn, and you lose. Yeah. Same. Uh, that's. I mean, you could even go almost the same with that 2015 team. We yeah. obliterated everybody, and then when you kind of got that team that was good enough but not really important enough to get your attention, right? You lose. So, I will, I would actually I think that's how we win, right? And, and if you even if you look at it, look at the two thousand and fourteen, the uh, two thousand twelve Final Four, that was probably the most loaded Final Four there was. We played Louisville, and then we played Kansas, right? Two teams that was going to make you have their attention. Yep, yep, and it makes I, the tournament. I think. For me, it makes it more fun for me when we're playing big name teams. I've I've had a blast this this year has been more fun for me than probably the last couple because it, it seems like every game we've played has been a tough game against a ranked opponent. I, absolutely, and even the games that aren't as tough last last week's Vanderbilt, you kind of need it. Yeah, you know, right. even if Mississippi State wasn't ranked, you didn't want to lose that one because it was wedged in between Auburn and Kansas. You know, you kind of wanted to keep that bridge going. So, I I love the schedule. And I honestly think that if you put us against the best teams going all the way, I think that's how we win the title. Because I guarantee you, we play IU, those guys will be ready. We play North Carolina in the Elite Eight, those guys will be ready. We play at Duke in the championship game, they will be ready. I agree. So. I agree. Hey, man, it's been been an absolute pleasure having you on. Who's your Super Bowl winner? Who you got? You know, you know, I don't follow the NFL that much. I'm, I'm more of a college and MLB guy, but how can you not go with Tom Brady in anything, yes. right? You know? Yes. I mean, Blitz for six. How can, how can you not go against him? I am probably would be cheering for Gurley and the SEC connection there, but ah, you got to go with Brady to, in, in any big game. All right, man. Like I said, it's been great having you on. 
Yeah, absolute thank pleasure. You so much. It, it, it doesn't awesome. hurt that I, I love anybody on the show that agrees with me. That that, that that's never. That's why I love the Kentucky fan. That's why I love him doing it. Even people who disagree, it's not in a big thing. It's not a big way. You're like, oh, you know what? I like that. You know, I think this team's better than that team. You know, it, it's still fun. Kentucky's the best fan base. It's an honor to have you on. Let me know when you write something else. Let me know when you're free. We'll bring you on again. Anything on the way out? Yeah, yeah. Just uh, thank you for having me. This has been absolutely awesome. Um, like I told you, I think when we started, I was a little bit nervous doing it. But once once you get talking to – a host as great as you. I mean, he just it just flows, man. And yes, and yes, I will take all the praise. Yeah, Hear that I give you the <laughs> praise, baby. No, yes, a- absolutely. You, you, once you got settled in, your knowledge in the SEC is, is off the charts. Thank you for being on. That is it. We will be back. Actually, I'll be doing a post game show after the South Carolina game. So tune in. Hopefully, we can bring Darren on to that too. I know he's a very busy person after the game. But that is it for this episode. Big Blue Breakdown is out. All right, man. That's it. We'll we'll awesome. cut it at that mark. Yeah. We got we ran about ninety minutes. I tried to keep it at the ninety minute mark. I mean, sounds good, brother. I I had a blast, man. Anytime you want me to come on, just let me know. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I've been trying to find out ways to squeeze out more content. It's it's one of those ones where you get a little scared, you know, yeah. because.